I'm Dan Burns, joined by my colleague uh, Jonathan Hanna. Hello. And we've been having a lot of fun working with the Frank Hertz uh, experiment apparatus that we have at PASCO. You can see we have a lot of equipment here, but if you just were joining us for the photoelectric effects, the top three boxes here we all used with mm -hmm. that. And so we just had to add a second power supply and then of course the uh, Frank Hertz tube that we're using. So I thought I would walk through the setup of this and kind of talk about the logic behind it. Now, one thing I already did is I connected the Frank Hertz filament to the tube to this power supply and set it to 3.4 volts because we need to warm up the filament for 15 minutes. And so that uh, made this go a little bit more efficient. Now, how do I know what voltage to set it to? Well, there's a manual that comes with this. There's a Word file. There's a capstone file we'll be showing you. But it's better to look at the sticker on the top of the tube because some of these have different numbers. And these are suggested values. Uh, so if you're writing up lab experiments, double check what values are here if you want to put the values in the lab experiment. But this particular tube said filament voltage 3.4 volts. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. I was going to say we had some other ones that were two and a half. Yeah, and it's possible too a lot of times with these uh, filament voltages that, I mean, this is, as Dan said, this is a suggested uh, voltage for this particular tube, but you might have yeah. to adjust the voltage you know, slightly by, you know, maybe point one or point two voltage to get uh, to get the filament voltage just yeah, right for the experiment. The electron uh, flux is, I think, proportional to the square of the voltage. So mm -hmm. you get a lot more electrons as you uh, raise it or fewer. Uh, and that can be something you can explore in your experiment. So let's uh, hook up the uh, current amplifier here first to the Frank Hertz tube. And so this is a BNC cable. And it goes here. And right there. And we want to zero it and make sure it's in the right range. And so Jonathan caught this right before we turned the camera on. Uh, I had the range setting wrong and that can cause problems. Sometimes you want to adjust it, mm -hmm. but it's on 10 to the minus 10, and that's recommended and in, in the instructions. And then if I push this button in, we're disconnected and we can calibrate this so that it reads zero. And once you calibrate it, you want to leave it alone and release that. So if you're doing this experiment and you notice a student group is not getting any current, that's what I would check first is that button because if you have it in, it's not doing anything. Oh, it's, except it's negative zero. Yeah. We want positive zero. No, if it changes a little, we're good. We well, you're an it. optimist, right? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have it at zero. So now we want to hook up uh, the rest of this. And we're going to be outputting data. You can just read the numbers off these. So if you aren't using a computer, uh, or an interface, you can read it off here, but with this experiment, it goes so much easier to have uh, data captured by the computer. You can do a lot more analysis and, and explore some other things going on. You get a lot more data points. <laughs> yeah. Or, well, you know, the time you're willing to invest. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> so I have the computer do it as opposed to having to do each little data point on a piece of paper. And so I'm gonna hook up this DIN cable for the current amplifier to uh, source A on the 850 interface because the capstone file that you can download right from our website now is configured that way, but you can configure it however you want. And then the voltage, well, I've got four different voltages. The one that's important is the one down here um, that I'm gonna be just adjusting from zero to 85 volts. Uh, giving the electrons more and more energy as they get accelerated down the tube. That's what we want to read here. The other ones we can just 
pull off the box. And there are two connections here. So if I look carefully, this is the one, the lower one I want from zero to 100. There's also a zero to 200 range. This tube says it can only go up to 85 volts which is plenty. Yeah, you definitely don't want to go above that because you do risk uh, damaging the yeah. tube. And so I put that into B again because the capstone file is configured for that. We'll look at that in a little bit. Now, this is sometimes called a tetrode uh, because there's a lot, four different kind of connections. We have the filament hooked up already. Then right past the filament is grid one. And grid one, we're going to put a small voltage on it to uh, kind of pull the electrons off the filament and get them into the accelerating field. And so that connects G1 and the cathode. And that is a small voltage that is gonna be provided by uh, this power supply. And and since, you know, since we have a lot of things here to keep track of, um, I'm just going to mark some of these down so go. we can make sure we know what uh, what we're dealing with. So we got the filament voltage filament. right there, and then G1, the first grid. Let's see, we have that one right here. There you go. There we go. Hopefully that stays and on. And then we have the, you know, the main thing we're doing is trying to apply a voltage to accelerate the electrons, uh, so they have the inelastic collisions with the mercury atoms. And that is uh, from the cathode to the second grid, G2, at the end of that potential. And so we can use the same connection to the cathode and then to G2. Okay. Yeah. That one right there. And then finally, uh, between the anode and grid two, we want to put sort of a barrier for the electrons. So they've got to have a decent amount of energy to make it to the uh, anode. So if they just had an inelastic collision with the mercury atom right in front of grid two, they're not going to show up in our current. Uh, and so that's another thing, a parameter that you could adjust and see its effect. Um, this particular experiment, I think we set it to 10 volts. Mm -hmm. And again, it does say on the um, on the tube itself what the ideal voltages are. Okay. There we go. So and again, it, it does, like he says, it's on the tube. So the um, the cath cathode voltage that we're just trying to get the electrons off the filament, we're going to set that to one and a half. And we're going to be putting some references in the chat for you. I found one um, that was very helpful and described experiments they had their students do adjusting uh, things like the voltage on the cathode and the filament voltage and the stopping voltage, the grid two voltage, and, of, uh, and seeing how that changed things. And so... Uh, there's, there's more to this than just repeating the Frank Hertz one. Then we want this guy to be 10 volts. I really crank them. Mm -hmm. This goes up to 12. So 10, one and a half, that's you know, close enough as long as you record the values you actually used in your lab, those are close enough. I'm not gonna, uh, and then we leave this on zero until we're ready to collect data. So let's open up the uh, capstone file and take a look at it. Again, you don't have to use this. So there's two, there's one that says Frank Hertz with data and then just Frank Hertz. And so we're gonna look at that but once we show how the data collection goes, we'll go and just open up one that we've already collected data. Actually, that's one you can download yourself and do check our analysis. Maybe we made a mistake. <laughs> now, um, 
let's go through the pages here. So it shows uh, some sample data, a uh, little bit of history on this. So uh, the Frank Hertz, it was uh, kind of the key piece of evidence that the Bohr model of the atom is uh, was uh, worth uh, exploring anyway, showing that energy levels were quantized in an atom. In this case, the, they did the mercury atom. Um, what's interest was interesting to me is they had no idea about Bohr's paper when they did this. Mm -hmm. And so some people say they were trying to support the Bohr model. They weren't aware of it. Uh, there's an old PSSC film on the Frank Hertz experiment that in the beginning, the guy doing the lab sort of implies that. He pretty much says they were doing it to support the Bohr model. And then guess who comes on the film at the end? Um, James Frank, and he, he says, no, we had no idea about it. So I wonder if he was even correcting them on the film. Uh, but that was, uh, I recommend that film. Now, also on that page, it has an image of what the, um, yeah, we are on the same page, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. what the tube looks like. And one thing that uh, probably want to encourage to do, you know, for your students is you can uh, actually take the tube out. There's two screws on the back that you can remove. And you can take a look on the inside what the tube actually looks like. And um, in the tube here, it's kind of hard to decipher, and I'm not sure how well you can actually see on camera, but uh, you can see that you have your first grid right down there, and then you have your second grid at the top um, right above it, and just right above that you have the anode, which is very tiny, so I'm not sure how well you can see that. But uh, We have a sort of a linear model, some of them are cylindrical, where the uh, cathode is in the middle and the anode is around it. And at first I thought ours was like that too when I saw that shield there, but yeah. no, it's, ours goes... That's what you there. see in that uh, PSSC film, I believe. Yeah, yeah. but it, it's, it's got a schematic there. And then ours has um, argon uh, gas in it. And the original experiment was mercury. And one thing about mercury, well, it's the original experiment, so it'd be cool to do it, mm -hmm. but you have to heat it. And so that apparently is, a, a, you know, an extra step some people want to avoid. So ours is using argon, which you don't have to heat. I think the advantage of mercury would be you could do the experiment without heating it as a control. Mm -hmm. And then you see the current go up. There's no dips or anything. Um, but there's a definite safety advantage with this yeah. also versus mercury. Using and you argon. could measure the uh, light being produced. Like Frank Hertz, that was another, the second experiment, which was maybe just as important. Um, with neon. Uh, no, the, they, they may or, measure the mercury. Oh, with mercury, I'm oh, sorry. But um, this one, the wavelength is so short and it's mainly, it's probably way too dim. To get it bright enough to measure, even if you had equipment, yeah. you'd probably damage the tube to get that much current. So we don't measure that. Um, neon actually produces a visible glow, but that is not the transition that you're measuring from the ground state to the first energy level. It's another one that happens, but it is kind of cool. A friend of mine, David Morasco at Foothill College has done all three gases and he has a great picture on his website. I think we're putting that in the chat that um, shows the neon when there's several uh, inelastic collisions happening for a particular electron. Um, but I think we did pick the one that, that main advantage of the argon is you get more um, crests uh, and troughs, mm -hmm. peaks and, yeah. and troughs, so you can get better data. So there's, so you got a little bit of reading for the students. There's a picture that looks just like this, right? Isn't that picture? I mean, it's, it's uncanny. No, it's uh, uh, idealized, right? There is a photo of it. But when I was looking at this, I noticed in the photo, they left the ground off the filament. So uh, we did better than the photo. Whoops. <laughs> They're not supposed to use this for, use the diagram. And so this, we've already done all this, at least hopefully we have. And so we are ready to record. Looks like everything's rocking here. We get this on, mm -hmm. uh, it's connected. And so you say record. Well, now what I'm gonna do is turn this voltage dial from zero to 85 volts and take the manual suggests three minutes. And so that's kind of slow. So I'm not gonna do the whole thing. 
And you can challenge your students because there's various techniques that you might try using to get the smoothest data. Because again, there is a little lag in the power supplies uh, when you collect. So let's see this. So I'm going to start turning it. And at first, it's just a whole lot of nothing because we have to we have that uh, contact potential to get over. And then also the first energy level from the ground state. Then it starts to go up. So what I'm doing is just kind of taking my uh, two fingers and sort of walking along the dial. That was the technique I settled on. I tried to get uh, one of our engineers, John Hanks, to make a little stepper motor powered gripper that would do this for me and, and he had better things to do. Uh, and so you can see we got that first peak, second peak and a third and keep going up to 85. I think I'm just gonna go and, and get data that's already done there for the sake of efficiency, but nice and smooth if we expand that before I go look at the complete data. Stop. And so real easy to measure good values off that. Uh, this first peak is real sensitive to the values that you put here. And so you can play around with it, make some adjustments to maybe make that a little tighter. Um, let's go and look at the final data here. Well, it's, well before we do that, let's just show the analysis we would do mm -hmm. with this. So what I need to do is measure the voltage at each peak and each trough and put that in a data table. And so Capstone makes that real easy. It's kind of two choices. Jonathan said he wanted to use the uh, coordinate tool and he can just put that guy there and drag it around and say, oh, there it is, it's 33.4. There's also another tool that I ended up using. It's pretty much the same thing in this case, um, the multi-coordinate tool. And so I just watched the uh, current values. I went across, and when I see it's at its greatest, 9.161, then I would look down there and pull off the voltage. And one advantage to the uh, coordinates tool also is that it has a delta tool built into it, so you can find the difference between the peaks. Right. Or you can, or you, or you can use a calculator yeah. too. Well, yeah. <laughs> Do the old-fashioned way. That's in a lot of experiments, so that is very useful. Yeah. So you would go and do that. So let's look at the one with data. So this has the same pages we saw with instructions and things but there's you know, answers in the analysis and some sample data. And so there is uh, completing it. And they went a little past 85 volts, but they might've had a tube that, I think some of the tubes go up to 100 volts. So you wanna look at the tube. Um, there's another word of caution in the manual that uh, it says really keep a close eye on the current when you're measuring this. If it just starts shooting up vertically uh, you should turn the voltage all the way down and turn the filament voltage down some. Mm -hmm. I think as time goes on, the characteristics of the tube might change a little. Yeah. And so that's in the directions it tells the students that'd be something to, to talk about with them. Um, and so they had uh, all those uh, peaks, all those troughs. And if you go to the analysis, the graph is on that page too. And so it makes it real easy so we went across and measured all the peak voltages, all the trough voltages. Uh, I think we put a calculation in to calculate the difference. And so the Delta tool does it, and here they yeah. have a little calculation that just subtracts the two in the calculator uh, page. Uh, and then you can have it take the differences and calculate the standard deviation and the trough uh, differences in the standard deviation. You can see we got kind of uh, different numbers for the difference between the peaks and the troughs. 
And there are reasons for that. Uh, when you're at a peak, there's a lot more electrons and there's a spread of energies there. And so they're spread out, measuring the exact peak is a little uh, trickier. And there's really four different possible transitions from the ground state to that first energy level. It's really spread over really four. And all four of those are possible there around the peaks. But everything I was reading, we have some references if you're interested in this, uh, at the trough when there's a lot less electrons involved, um, two of those energy transitions dominate. And one of them really is, is the main one. Uh, that's 104, I have it down somewhere. Um, well, it's uh, the 1s2 transition and uh, has the 104.8 nanometer, 11.83 electron volt energy. And so if you want your students to compare what they measure with the actual energy transition, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, there's, there's four there, but if you read the literature that, that we link to there, you can at least give them some guidance on that if you want. Now, uh, I mentioned my friend, uh, David Morasco. He had a different twist to the analysis that I thought was pretty slick. And so he doesn't have his students calculate the, difference, volt, the differences in the voltages and get an average. He makes a graph, so we can just do it right here. And we're going to graph, well, first let's do the peak voltage versus, well, just the number, which on here is a choice is index. And let's get rid of those connecting lines and do a linear fit. And so the slope there tells me it's 11.2 volts per delta in the peaks. And so it's a little different from the 11.08, and it's also plus or minus 0.25 instead of 1.15. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a better analysis technique. And then we can also put on the same graph, I can say add a similar, similar measurement and do the trough. And that gives me 11.7 plus or minus 0.042. So notice how much similar, it's much similar because there's not as much spread in the data. So the trough voltage is easier to compare to a theoretical value. And we usually get better data. Um, when I first did this, I go, wait a minute, shouldn't the, the trough line be below the peak line? But it's that first trough comes at a higher voltage. So yep. it, it threw me at first. Didn't throw Jonathan. <laughs> Come on. And then you can uh, um, have them do the analysis to figure out the wavelength associated with the energy. There's a voltage, you can put it in electron volts. And this goes through an example. And down here it says the accepted value for the wavelength is that most probable one, the 104.8. And in this experiment, um, we measured 106 plus or minus two nanometers with this data. Uh, I went through this half a dozen times, well, completely a half dozen times, much more than that. It's, it's, I was enjoying it. Uh, I got much better data than that most of the time, um, usually within a half a nanometer of that. So I, I, I do think uh, that that is a good value to have them compare it to. And let's see here. We talked about why argon. I think we covered everything. Mm -hmm. And so there are, again, a lot of great uh, reading in the, um, in the chat if you're interested. Some of it is them measuring what these energy transitions are. And that's where I got some of the, the information and then that great paper um, showing how students varied these different parameters to sort of see what's optimal. Uh, but it actually agreed with most of the values we had, so that was good to see. Yeah.